Good afternoon and welcome to the Gestalt IT Rundown for Wednesday, June 2nd, 2021. My name is Tom Hollingsworth and happy National Rocky Road Day. I am your almond flavored host for this look at this week's news and joining me is the mallowest of marshes, Mr. Stephen Foskett. Stephen, welcome to the show. Hey, it's good to be here. It's a butter crunch kind of day, I think. Butter crunch. Um, you know, I, I could probably go with that. Thankfully, it's also National Running Day. So after I have a pint of Rocky Road, I'm going to have to go get rid of all those calories. But the news that we have for you is definitely fat free and full of flavor. So we're going to go ahead and jump into some of the top stories from this week. Starting off with uh, some news from our friends over at Intel. Now, Pat Gelsinger has definitely been out in front of the company. And at this week's Computex, he reiterated that the um, exploding work from home pandemic situation has led to a massive supply shortage for almost all semiconductors. And he's projecting that this could last for a couple of years, according to his exact words. Now, the good news is, is this matches the exact same prediction that he gave back to the Washington Post in April. And he is specifically targeting the car manufacturing side of the house as being a place there where there is a massive chip shortage. Intel has recently sunk about $20 billion into opening new chip facilities, and they're offering their fabrications for third parties to come in and, and for Intel to make chips for them. Now, Stephen, Pat's never been one to be hyperbolic about things like this. Do you feel like his prediction's accurate? And do you think that we're going to see the shortage kind of roll out over the next 24 months? Well, let me say this. So also this week, Elon Musk compared the chip shortage to the toilet paper shortage earlier in the pandemic and said that everybody was just over ordering. Who do you want to believe, Elon Musk or Pat Gelsinger? Uh, I'll take Pat for 500, please. Um, he actually knows what he's talking about. And frankly, he's right. The chip shortage is going to last for years because it doesn't matter how much money they want to sink into it. It doesn't matter how many fabs they build. All aspects of the supply chain are affected by this, and it's going to take literally years to build up enough supply chain to meet the demand. And, and that's the thing. We've got here kind of a, a crossroads of not just a supply problem, but a demand problem as well. And uh, you just can't fix that, not even by applying liberal amounts of money. Uh, we've even heard stupid stuff like Tesla suggesting that they would build their own chips. Cool. Are you going to build your own substrates as well? Are you going to build your own chip manufacturing capability? Uh, you know, you're going to build your own machines to make those chips. You're going to invent your own lithography. Uh, the bottom line is, it's not going to be solved anytime soon. And Pat's right; it's going to be years before this stuff gets straightened out. Uh, that being said, uh, you know, Elon Musk does have a point that companies are uh, over-ordering, perhaps, and are trying to stock up, and everybody's trying to lock in supplies. And that means that everybody all the way down the line is starting to be affected. I'm hearing from really small independent companies, cool companies like my friends Olamex over in Bulgaria who are unable to get chips as well, simply because they're bumped way, way down the line because they're waiting behind you know, General Motors and Tesla and not to mention, of course, Intel, AMD, NVIDIA, companies like that. So yeah, there's going to be chip shortages for a long time. And this is a systemic problem, and it's going to take a lot of time and money and effort to pull us out of it. Tom, uh, ransomware is obviously one of the most important stories <laughs> of the year, and it seems just to be getting getting worse. And so this year, uh, or this week, we saw uh, Zscaler decide that they're going to try to improve their uh, ransomware protection. Uh, in their Q3 earning call uh, yesterday, they announced they're picking up uh, India-based smoke screen, smoke screen technologies, not star screen technologies. That would be so cool, though, uh, for an und undisclosed amount. Uh, the addition of the Zero Trust Network Access startup uh, will bolster the way security professionals can defend against potential career-ending events. Tom, is there a fire here for Zscaler, or is this just smoke and mirrors? I think what you're seeing here is a response to the fact, like you mentioned, that ransomware is becoming a more mm, lucrative operation for people overseas. And what you're getting response back from customers is they're going to their security provider of choice and saying, all right, I hear what you're saying, but what have you got to fix this particular problem that I'm super, super worried about? 
and a lot of the traditional vendors are like, yeah, I don't have that. So they're going out and picking up companies that are already kind of focusing in on that. And uh, of course, you know, smokescreen technologies founded in Israel by um, probably former members of the IDF. Uh, that seems to be the, the the current trend of security startups is be founded by former military people in Israel that used to do this for a living and then get acquired by some company that's much bigger than you that needs your expertise, which is great for them. It's not so great for the companies that are kind of caught with their flat footed on this because ransomware had always kind of been seen as like one of those edge cases. It's like, oh yeah, it'll happen to you, but don't click on links and it won't be an issue. And then it got super sophisticated very, very fast. And worse yet, it got super targeted towards people. Good luck to the people at Zscaler for this acquisition. I hope it bolsters your capabilities. Of course, good luck to the folks at Smokescreen for you know your exit. Um, I hope that you are happy where you end up, whether it's at Zscaler or somewhere else after your non-compete expires. But ultimately, this is not a problem that's going to go away. And I think we're going to dig into that a little bit in the upcoming stories, um, maybe right now, because Exagrid found themselves in a bit of a tough spot last week, because according to some reporting from Le Mag IT, the backup vendor was forced to pay a ransom of just over 50 Bitcoin to unlock all of their files. Now, here's where it gets fun. So the attackers had been inside the Exagrid network since the beginning of May and have provided proof that they had access to all of the files and had locked all of them up. The opening bid was seven and a half million dollars. After a little back and forth between the two companies, it was finally negotiated down to around $2.6 million. However, once Exagrid paid, they managed to lose or delete the decryption tool that was sent to them and had to request another copy be sent along to unlock all of their files. It's particularly egregious in the case of Exagrid because one of their biggest selling points for the last six months has been their ransomware protection. In fact, they won awards for it back in December of 2020. So yeah, um, Stephen, what should we make of this? I don't want to dance on their grave and I uh, don't want to even feel at all amused by this story because frankly, this is the situation that so many companies are going through. I think it is, yeah, it's ironic that a maker of data protection software uh, would fall victim to ransomware. But that being said, the, the, everybody, I think, can uh, sympathize with the situation that they found themselves in. Um, you know, I think that the, uh, the thing to me that's most interesting is that we're hearing some of the details here about how this really goes down. And so for me, that's the interesting aspect or the most interesting aspect of this story to see how the negotiations went, um, to see how the ransomware uh, criminals uh, proved that they had access to the data and that they uh, knew, you know, and, and how the conversations went back and forth and all that kind of stuff. Um, also, isn't it interesting that according to this story, uh, the ransomware gang not only had a good customer service uh, operation, but responded in a timely manner to customer service requests. Uh, oh, you need another copy of that? No problem. We'll 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 set you up. Um, boy, this is uh, this is really super embarrassing for Exagrid, and um, and yet it's super embarrassing for all the companies that have been affected by ransomware. And I think that this is you know, like I said, the, read the story to see the details of how a ransomware um, ransom goes down. Um, not to dance on Exegrid's grave over their failure to protect their own data. I mean, the cobbler's shoes and all that is totally true. Um, but that being said, too, also, oh my gosh, what is going on with companies paying the ransom? Um, here's a clue. I, I know that you're sad that you lost all your data and it's all locked up and all that good stuff, but um, paying the ransom just makes it worse. And uh, that's how it is. Uh, so what can you do? Anyway, yeah. Sorry about that. Um, let's let's talk about something not ransomware for a minute. Uh, faster than a speeding bullet. It's quick. 
Uh, the quick UDP internet connections protocol is now on track to be a full internet standard thanks to RFC 9000, not HAL 9000, that's something different, uh, released on May 27th. Uh, back in 2013, Google introduced QUIC, which was pr proposed as a replacement for TCP. The idea is that QUIC has less overhead and results in less traffic and faster connections. QUIC has many proponents from Cloudflare to Microsoft, who's using it for SMB, yes, not SIFs. Uh, around 12% of the traffic on the internet uses QUIC today, uh, with adoption poised for growth uh, now that it's a standard. Tom, um, we excited by this? Yeah, I think it is because we've always had problems with TCP. Um, it's just, it's heavy. It's designed for really lossful networks where, you know, the likelihood of packets making to the other side is slim. And so you needed things like, you know, uh, you needed something like checksums, you needed things like sequence numbers, so that if something wound up in the other end, we could reassemble it. Now, truth be told, we don't need it as much anymore because the packet streams are not nearly as crappy as they used to be. And so Quick essentially says, well, if we're going to run TLS over the top of anything anyway, does the underlying transport really matter because TLS will take care of the sequence number stuff? So they said, well, why don't we just run it over UDP? And that's essentially what Quick is. It's TLS over UDP. It's been baked into Chrome for a very long time, which is why adoption numbers are as high as they are. Um, so Google's definitely been playing around with it, and they've definitely been refining it. The fact that Cloudflare adopted it, and even Microsoft taking a stab at it, because let's be fair, SMB probably would work, run a little bit better over that and provide you with some uh, you know, encryption capabilities through TLS. The fact that they're proposing it as an internet standard effectively means that they're done experimenting on it, which is great, because I'm all for a replacement for TCP. I just hope that we're done tweaking it and that it, it's stable and that we can run it and it all works well. Because if we're not done tweaking on it or worse yet, Google tries to jump in and go, well, here's quick plus or something like that. It's going to disrupt the market. And we've seen this a lot with uh, you know other things like routing protocols. Well, I'm going to use my flavor. I'm going to use my flavor and they don't talk to each other. The reason why TCP works is because yeah, it was built in the seventies by Vent Surf, but more importantly, it was kind of a, it was a stable base that nobody ever tweaked. Like it may be old and it's like your, your, your grandma's Cadillac. It's old and slow and practically bulletproof. So don't mess with it. You know, quick is like a Tesla sports car, but people are constantly ripping pieces of it out and like, what if we replace it with this? Well, what if we put that in there? Well, you know, what if we put a rocket engine on the back? Stop it. Just, just build a car that people want to drive. That's, that's all I got to say to Google. Also, um, the over 9,000 jokes can now begin for all RFCs after Quick. So congratulations to, to Google for, for breaking that ice. All right, Stephen, um, let's talk a little bit of uh, numbers. Uh, the reason why is because some of our favorite IT dinosaurs and a few of the little mammals that are underfoot are recovering from the pandemic and they all had quarterly results that came out in the last few days. Um, reports came in from HPE, Dell Technologies, Pure Storage, Nutanix, and Snowflake. Now that we've had a chance to look at those and, and basically compare the numbers like Chris Malore did in the article that we're going to link to, what can we say about recovery in the enterprise IT market in general and specifically around storage? Well, I think that what's interesting here is that we're seeing roughly the pattern we expected to see overall in terms of the recovery from the pandemic. And that is that the quarters of uh, desperation uh, a year ago look pretty much how you'd expect they would for most of these companies. Uh, most of them ticked downwards um, in terms of uh, revenues overall. Uh, most of the revenue actually was, you know, was in negative growth territory um, for most of these products. But then we did see something of a recovery in uh, the second half of last year, last calendar year. It is a little confusing always to look at these things because each of these companies uses different quarters. So, for example, we are in FY, we just finished FY or Q1 FY22 for pure storage. Um, so it's like, wait, we did? But yeah, yeah, we did. Um, and if you look at the numbers, uh, for example, pure storage, uh, their revenue uh, kicked down. Um, it was basically flat uh, in that, that worst quarter, and then it kicked down the quarter after, and then it kind of grew a little bit in the next quarter. And then this previous quarter uh, that we just finished, it actually 
is back on track to accelerate. Um, good news for pure storage, uh, even though they're still losing money. Um, if you look at a similar company, uh, Nutanix, uh, the story is a little bit different because there we had a company that was already leveling off a couple of years ago and hasn't shown uh, strong year-on-year -year growth in quite a while. Um, but for them as well, if you look at the uh, release, you know, the, the most recent quarter, you see a very nice, smooth, upward trajectory of their revenue. In other words, this is a company, even a company that was already uh, facing challenges in the market is now um, back to heading up, uh, which is, again, I think good news for the economy. If you look at the big monsters, the dinosaurs of the uh, of the world, uh, you'll see that things are a little bit more complicated. Uh, Dell, for example, has been flat for a few years. Uh, remember, this is a company that uh, was private for a little while, but uh, now that we've got public numbers, they've roughly been flat uh, for the last few years, and they remain so. But that being said, they were declining during the pandemic, and so uh, going back to flat after declining um, is kind of a gain. And then for HPE, HPE is actually growing again. Um, even their storage systems are growing. And, and Dell as well showed, if you kind of dig into the numbers, you'll see that the lower to mid-range storage systems at Dell uh, actually grew, even though the high-end ones didn't. Um, what does this say overall about the market? Well, it says that um, the market is recovering kind of as we expected that it would from the pandemic. It also says, I think, something very important about storage, which is that mid-range storage is coming back, but high-end storage is not. And that may have a lot to do with the nature of modern applications and the nature of um, you know, how things are being deployed these days. And, and frankly, I think that means that uh, we had better look at the market changing. And if the market for high-end storage is changing, I think that that also means that the market for some other components might change as well. Um, you know, big honking data center switches, for example, uh, might not uh, be as important anymore in a more uh, east-west network world. Uh, and this kind of goes to the last one here, Snowflake. Um, they didn't see any decline at all at all during the, the, the pandemic, and they are only accelerating now in this previous quarter. And talk about little rodents among the dinosaurs. This is a case, I think, where effectively we've got a, a brand new market, a brand new type of, of data processing, and it's doing really, really well. And frankly, I think that tells us something as well about the nature of uh, the market. If I, I wish that some more of these companies were public so that we could watch their revenues as well, because I would love to know uh, the numbers coming out of some of these companies that are really growing like gangbusters, at least say they are. I'd love to have real numbers about that, but frankly, we've got to make do with the public numbers and the public numbers say we're coming out of this thing. So that's, that's good. Um, Tom, uh, now that we've talked a little bit about some of these quick stories, let's get, take a closer look at some of the big ones. And this first one is a doozy, let me tell you. Those of us who followed uh, the world of Tech Field Day and the world of Gestalt IT know that we're very close to HPE and Aruba and Silver Peak, and all of these companies are now you know, one company. And we've got some news in that. So this is kind of breaking news. Um, According to Aruba's earnings announcement, uh, Kirti uh, Melkoti, the CEO of Aruba, uh, VP of at parent uh, HPE, is retiring. Uh, he will be staying on as an advisor until the HPE fiscal year ends on October 31st of this year. Also departing are uh, longtime execs and familiar faces at Aruba, uh, Partha Narashiman, uh, CTO, and Pradeep Iyer, former chief ar architect. Uh, Alongside this announcement is the appointment of HPE Communications and Technology Group head Phil Moltram uh, to the role of President and General Manager of Aruba. And joining him in the role of Chief Product and Technology is David Hughes, who was formerly the CEO of Silver Peak, uh, which was acquired by HPE uh, just last year and integrated into Aruba. Uh, Tom, I think there's more going on here than just 
this executive is departing and this executive is coming in. What, what do you make of this? Yeah, so this was a big story, and, and I was very happy that we were able to get it onto the rundown because it literally broke at the end of the earnings call yesterday. Um, I got a small heads up about it, and immediately the wheels started turning. Uh, so first and foremost, um, for those of you who don't know, if, you should definitely read the blog post that we're going to link in the show notes because Kirti is the founder of Aruba Networks. Like, this is his baby. And with Partha and Pradeep and Dom Orr, they built this company and, and they built a juggernaut that eventually was reverse acquired by HP. That's the term that's always been used. And really it, it kind of, it felt weird when you realize that essentially what HP did was they bought the company and then sent all of their networking equipment over there and said, figure this stuff out. And at the time to say that HP networking was chaotic would be an understatement. And Aruba did everything that they could to streamline that process. They, you know, they jettisoned the stuff they didn't need anymore. They focused on the edge. They brought in new data center switches. We were happy enough to be able to see some of the launch of those data center switches at Tech Field Day. And then they brought on board Silver Peak, um, which really kind of closed a gap in, in their technology portfolio in SD-WAN. Um, Aruba had developed their own SD branch technology, but it really didn't, it didn't meet the needs that companies had for, for enterprise grade B2B SD-WAN. And so now we see that Kirti's leaving, which in and of itself would have been a pretty big message. But so are Partha and Pradeep. That's every old guard HPE person that has decided that it's time to hang it up. Um, now, I love these guys. I have talked to Kirti on a regular basis. Partha and I have great conversations, not just here, but on the Airheads community. And so these guys are going to do super well wherever they decide to go. The rumor that I keep hearing is they're going to found some kind of incubator and they're going to go build the next Aruba with some other great people by, through funding it. Because Dom Orr already does that. So th that's like a, that's a slam dunk for them. So happy trails to you guys. And, uh, and thanks for all the hard work that you've done. But that means we've got to turn our attention back to HPE. And I, as soon as I heard the news, my first thought, literally my first thought is, where is David Hughes going to end up? Because David Hughes was the CEO of Silver Peak, and he is an intelligent human being. And my first thought was that he was going to take Kirti's spot. And then I find out that it's not that, that he's taking Partha's spot as the chief architect. And now I'm wondering why you put an old guard HPE person in charge of Aruba and put the smart guy in charge of the technology. And maybe the reason why you do that is because Aruba might not be around much longer. And we've seen this before. If you think back just a few months to VMware and Dell and Pat being in charge, and then all of a sudden Pat's gone. And boy, as soon as that piece moves and a bunch of other pieces move around it, now a whole bunch of stuff starts happening all at once. And it makes me wonder if Kirti was the one holding off on any more tight integrations between the Aruba and HPE team and some deck chairs got rearranged before you know it. And then Kirti saw the handwriting on the wall and said, maybe now's the time to take my golden parachute and run or maybe just walk away. And now that he's gone, there's nothing left. To, to do this. And maybe David Hughes kind of had an agreement in place whenever Silver Peak was acquired that eventually he was going to get a top flight role inside of HPE. And this is the way to make all of that come to fruition. So I, I've been following these folks as well. And I have to say, uh, Kirti and uh, Partha are just tremendous, tremendously intelligent people, so dedicated to this company and so dedicated to the products. I assumed that as Tom mentioned, that the Aruba team would end up taking over HPE and that in this whole world, uh, we would end up with uh, HPE CEO becoming Kirti. Uh, however, that clearly didn't happen. And I'm surprised by that because what we've seen is basically the Arubaization of so much of HPE. And uh, that's been good for HPE. It's been a breath of fresh air for the company and it's helped HPE to recover from uh, basically be, uh, being a, an overextended dinosaur as it had been. You know, they spun off the HP Inc. stuff, they bought in Aruba, uh, they really got a shot in the arm and the company is actually looking up and looking uh, pretty, pretty good. Um, so I, I thought they would continue that, they're not. Uh, that's uh, to me, this story in a nutshell, they're not continuing with the Aruba team. 
Instead, uh, they're continuing with the Silver Peak team. And frankly, uh, I don't think that's so bad. Uh, the Silver Peak team is a good team too, but um, I uh, am interested. Uh, I wish I knew why uh, the Aruba team didn't end up making the cut. I, I was so confident that they were going to. So, you know, uh, I, I think that the, it's not the end of the world, uh, but I will say that uh, one of the things that's gonna suffer here is the overall vision and strategy that we saw coming out of Aruba at HPE. Uh, this is a company that uh, was, you may not really be familiar with the Wi-Fi market or really know what's going on with Aruba, but this is a company that really had a transformative strategic vision for their customers. And that vision, I'm wondering if there's gonna be continuity there and, and we'll find out, I suppose. Yeah, this is an unfolding story and there's definitely gonna be a lot of discussion going on. I've already got my own that's kind of going um, that I'm, I'm planning on writing about. So make sure that you stay tuned for that. But yeah, this is not a simple little CEO switch. This is, this is a massive thing in the industry. And if you remember Steven's reaction to the Pat Gelsinger news, I would say in networking, this is just as big as that. So, you know, make sure that you are, are tuned into the Gestalt IT rundown and also to gestaltit.com for more thoughts on what we've got going on here. All right, Stephen, um, we do have some news about uh, another uh, sale, if you will. Uh, this time it's Cloudera because they're going to be headed back into the land of private equity. Uh, the company announced yesterday that it has accepted an offer from KKR and Clayton, Dubillier, and Rice, CDNR. So this basically sounds like um, a bowl of alphabet soup to be acquired for about $16 per share, which is a premium over their closing price, and it totals out to be about $5.3 billion. Now, the Cloudera board has absolutely approved this acquisition, and of course has told the shareholders that they totally need to vote for it too. Guess who one of the largest majority shareholders in Cloudera is? That would be Carl Icahn's group. They own 18% of the stock, and guess what? They're voting for the sale too. Surprise, surprise, surprise. Now, Rob Bearden, the CEO of Cloudera, has released the usual statement to go along with it, saying that this is good for the shareholders and it provides a path for hybrid cloud leadership, the things you would expect to hear. Now, curiously enough, Cloudera also announced that they were buying two other SaaS companies in the same announcement when they announced they were being sold off to private equity. Uh, the number, the companies were Data Coral and Kazena. Um, Stephen? What's your analysis on this? Because I kind of find it funny that this company is going back private just a few years after they went public. And typically when you go private to a holding group and Carl Icahn's involved somehow, that does not bode well. That does not bode well. Uh, <laughs> let's just say that. Um, those of you in the industry who've been watching Cloudera, uh, this is a company that has uh, disappointed in terms of revenue but impressed in terms of strategy consistently since they started. And this is a company that I think most people in the industry, most people in the cloud industry, most people in you know hybrid cloud and, and enterprise data and analytics can look at Cloudera and say, there's a company that really understands what's going on. This is an important company that really, again, has a strategic vision for their customers, sort of like Aruba does in enterprise Wi-Fi, Cloudera does in data. And analytics and has become an incredibly important company in this space. But that being said, the company has never translated that into revenue and into shareholder value. And the company really disappointed as a public company. Uh, you know, the, the stock has, has kind of stunk up the joint because frankly, the company just didn't have the numbers to back up the valuation. I mean, the company raised a billion dollars uh, as a reminder, they ended up buying back Intel's investment. Intel invested uh, apparently about $700 million. Uh, last year, they, they bought that back from Intel for about 50 cents on the dollar. And um, at the time, that was seen as a good move for Cloudera. I think it still is a good move, uh, but a bad move for, a bad move for Intel. Um, now, uh, frankly, I think that it looks sort of prescient because frankly, what we're seeing here is a similar kind of situation where uh, Cloudera is finally just saying, you know, forget this, forget the public markets. Clearly, this isn't where we belong. Uh, we're going private. Now, I've been very critical of private equity overall, and I am not optimistic that KKR and CDNR 
are going to be good stewards of Cloudera. Uh, but that being said, Cloudera is, is a valuable company with a valuable product and a great strategic corporate vision. And if they can survive this, if they can weather this storm, they could come out much, much stronger as we saw with Dell Technologies when they went private with private equity. Uh, this may be one of the rare cases where private equity doesn't ruin the company, but in fact saves the company. Um, and frankly, uh, getting Carl Icahn out of there is probably a good move for them too. So um, overall, uh, I'm looking at this thing and I'm saying, boy, um, it's, <laughs> it's too bad that uh, good technology has to be ruined by Wall Street and, and revenue. You know, it's too bad we have to talk about money, but we kind of do have to talk about money. I mean, these are companies after all, and they're supposed to survive and they're supposed to thrive and Cloudera wasn't. And now maybe they have a chance to survive and thrive. Maybe they have a chance to execute their vision. And frankly, they were a little ahead of the time. Uh, they were kind of, in my mind, sort of the hybrid cloud company already in, in the way that that's come to mean enterprise extended data center, not cloud cloud, uh, hyperscaler cloud. And, um, you know, frankly, that vision's uh, time has come. So I, I think, honestly, honestly, this thing could work. Yeah, I, I, I always go back and forth on this because you need to take money in order to be able to run the company. And as we talked about earlier with the with the storage revenue stuff, I mean, you can only run a company for so long on losing money uh, if you don't have people who are giving it to you. And private ownership makes a whole lot of sense if you have good strategy and you've got good leadership at the top and you just need to figure out how to make your stuff work. Um, Wall Street is great if you need a lot of money and don't mind your organization being run by your local parent teacher organization. Think about how much those people argue and what they really want out of it. And that's kind of what it is. And then when Carl Icahn walks in, you might as well just bolt the doors and run like hell because you know what's going to happen. So I completely agree with your analysis here. What we hope, though, is that this does not mean that they're being um, eyed for the carving block, which is what typically happens in these large private equity acquisition things. Um, considering that they just bought two new companies, I don't think that's the case. I think that this is uh, restructuring out of the public eye, a la Dell and Dell Technologies. So, you know, I, I hope for the best for Rob Bearden and his team. Um, happy trails to Carl Icahn and his group. Go find some more carrion to pick apart. Um, but you know, ultimately I want to see how this, this plays out and tr quite honestly, I, I would rather that it buck the trend of the private equity, slow constricting death of a company. Well, Tom, I, I hate to do this. I really have to do it though. Um, there's another ransomware story in the news. And I think that this one is one that we have to talk about simply because it is big news and that is the beef, uh, we just heard that the largest meat processing company in the world, JBS, has been hit by ransomware. Uh, the firm detected the infection on May 30th and warned that it will cause beef prices to rise, sharp, rise sharply. A fifth of the meat processing capabilities in the U.S. are from JBS and their associated partner companies. Uh, the U.S. federal government has already reached out to the Russian government due to the nature of the attack. Surprise, surprise, it's originating with Russian criminal gangs. Coming quickly on the heels of the colonial pipeline attack, this latest incursion has raised calls for the global community to step in and protect critical infrastructure and industries from attack. Um, <laughs> critical like beef processing, I guess. Uh, is this an epidemic or are we just seeing exposure of previously unsavory targets now being targeted by ransomware? And also, what do you make about this morning's news that apparently uh, it's not gonna cause problems because they're actually getting production started again? Well, I think it's kind of funny that uh, there was a lot of goofball tweets about, you know, the cows escaping from the slaughterhouse and stuff yesterday. But this is something you have to understand, that these organizations have become so computerized with everything that they do that any disruption at all can cause massive problems. And yeah, I'm glad that they're able to ramp production back up. And unlike the colonial situation where, oops, we might have shut off the pipeline because we couldn't build customers, I think JBS really wants to get all the stuff out the door before it spoils, um, quite literally in this case. What you're seeing is enhanced sophistication. So the tools keep getting better to be able to do this. And there was always kind of this, I don't know, maybe it was like an agreement or maybe an understanding that you go after the businesses because that's where the money is. You know, these guys are the ones who will quietly write you a check for a few dozen Bitcoin 
and you move on to the next target. And, you know, it's like shaking down, um, you know, a guy in a business suit in, in the middle of the city and you're, when you're mugging someone. You're going to mug the guy with a Rolex because the guy obviously has money. I think, though, that what basically has happened is, is that these guys have learned to be so efficient at mugging everybody that they're just grabbing every target that they can find. I mean, you've got pipelines, you've got hospitals. Um, I just finished writing an article where a 911 call center got zapped by malware. That's a problem. Like, if you pick up the phone and dial 911 and nobody answers, you're going to panic. How long until it gets to something even worse? What if it hits a hydroelectric dam? Boy, don't you wish you could open the floodgates on that dam to keep things from spilling over the top or breaking the dam? Saying that's, you know, kind of a, a massive level problem. But that's why a lot of people are saying, all right, enough is enough. I mean, we, we, we kind of joke about it. They, you know, oh, look, it's another ransomware story. And if you listen to any security podcast, like the whole news section is dedicated to, oh, this company got hit, that company got hit. You know, we're still dealing with the fallout from the SolarWinds attack. I just saw a news story today that said that SolarWinds, the installer for the malware tool, removal toolkit may have been compromised too. But this is ultimately the problem. And we talked about it earlier and Stephen alluded to it. Companies are paying because they're scared, because they want their data back, because their countermeasures don't work. And quite honestly, the insurance companies aren't going to pay out anymore. We've seen that happening over and over and over again, which means you're funding them. And it, just like any spammer out there, if you give them money, they invest it in better tools. They use it to get better. And we talked about this uh, the last couple of weeks with the dark side crew that was responsible for hitting Colonial. We don't actually know who hit JVS right now, but the dark side crew scattered. And at first we were like, boy, I wonder if Cyber Command finally turned their, you know, orbital ion cannon on dark side. No, no, they scattered to the four winds before they could get caught, which means we're going to see all of them pop up running their own crews pretty soon. And that level of sophistication just carries over. So if you think back through the whole like history, uh, we've talked about Emotet before. That was one of the things that made the Emotet so dangerous is because Every time we saw a new strain of Emotet, it just kept getting better because it was a framework that we built on that was more and more virulent as time went on. That's what we're seeing in malware and ransomware. It's good at what it does. It gets in and it, you, it basically forces you to pay. And when you pay, you just, you, basically you're loading an extra bullet into the chamber because it's just going to get better next time but I don't know how to fix it. I mean, you've seen companies that are starting to do things like zero trust network um, access to maybe, I don't know, isolate the lateral movement of the attackers. Sorry, I had to make a cow joke there. But the other problem is you can't just assume that this is a training problem anymore because when you look at things you know, like WannaCry, it spread so fast through the network that Siemens never knew they were infected until their ships were already at sea. And then it's a massive cleanup operation. And I hate to say it, and I hate to use a non-technology solution to a technology problem, but it's time to throw down. If a government, any government, is offering safe harbor to these people, or at least blindly looking the other way while eating some borscht, it's time to be heavy handed. Fine. You want to, you want to have these attackers uh, hide inside your borders. Cool. We'll just close your borders off. We will stop trading with you. We will make you an international pariah, clean your house. And then we will allow you to come play with the kids. I mean, we've done it to North Korea for years. And I'll tell you that while North Korean crews are, are pretty well known, they're also not very effective because they don't have a whole lot of resources, but boy, the ones that are hiding in other countries, like the ones mentioned in this story, boy, they can get away with murder, can't they? I've even seen calls for basically vigilante justice of, well, if the Russians are going to do it, we should let our people do it too. Boy, wouldn't it be horrible if somebody just suddenly decided to hack everything inside of Russia all at once? I hope that nobody does that and gets away scot-free because we won't prosecute it. Now, granted, that's kind of, you know, that that's like escalation on a on a massive scale. But boy, they'd hate it if suddenly that happened to them, wouldn't you think? Yeah, I think that uh, that's a real interesting point. And I'm wondering, too, if some of this stuff don't go after beef. Oh, my God, it's America. America. America is yeah. not going to tolerate their beef getting messed up. And pork, um, too. 
It wasn't just beef. It was pork. So we cut out the not burgers the and pork. the sausage. Yeah, honestly, I I would not be surprised if eventually this finally gets the attention from Washington that it deserves. Um, but that being said, too, uh, another angle to this story, and the thing that I was thinking of when I was hearing about this, too, is if you look at malware and ransomware as a sort of a preview of what a cyber war would be, we are in deep trouble. Because if Frankly, if the Russian criminal gangs can get into a gas pipeline or a beef processing plant or whatever, uh, or a hospital, then the Russian government can as well in the, in the Russian army, in the, in the, you know, any army. Um, frankly, I know <laughs> that I've heard many stories about the capabilities that the U.S. Cyber Command has that they choose not to deploy. Uh, if there was a real cyber war, Consider this a preview of what the weapons can do and imagine there being no ransom and no recovery tool. That's what a cyber war would look like. And so maybe instead of ratcheting things up, we need to ratchet things down and look at the global uh, situation and start saying, how can we become more closely connected with all these countries instead of threatening them? Because frankly, uh, we really don't want a cyber war. Yeah. 60 so, years, I'd say, Stephen, 60 years ago, we found ourselves with a stockpile of weapons that could annihilate life as we know it and nothing to stop us from using them on each other. And it took two people stepping back from that brink to start the process of disarming everything. I think we need to get to that point again because if we don't, I mean, you think nuclear war is bad. Obviously it is because it could wipe out life on this planet. But we can wipe out life as we know it for human beings by erasing everything, setting us back to the Stone Age. And we may never know when it happens until we just wake up one day and our bank account is empty and, and everything just doesn't work. On that friendly note, uh, let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> well, with, with that fortunate outlook on reality, let's, uh, let's paint a slightly brighter picture. So we want to thank you all for tuning into the Gestalt IT Rundown uh, for this Wednesday. Uh, each and every Wednesday, we're here at 12.30 p.m. Eastern Time, bringing you, boy, I hope, more happy stories in the future and maybe less ransomware stories. Um, but we always scour the news to find things of interest. So if you have a story that you'd like to see us cover on the Rundown, please let us know. You can find me on Twitter. I'm at Networking Nerd. Of course, my partner in crime is at S. Foskett. Um, and we have lots of stuff going on. Stephen? What are some things that you're working on this month? Well, as we mentioned last week, uh, we had AI Field Day last week, and all those videos are now online. So if you're interested in AI applications and how they're affecting the enterprise, uh, just go to youtube.com slash techfieldday, and uh, you can watch the AI Field Day presentations. Um, we had some pretty good ones. And uh, I will let you know, too, that uh, the discussions aren't uh, super nerdy. Uh, well, they're as nerdy as uh, Gestalt IT Rundown. but. Uh, there's a lot of interesting uh, aspects in here that uh, I think even the layman would be interested in, in terms of, uh, you know, ethics and uh, the morality uh, of AI and the practical applications of it. So uh, please do check out some of those videos. And of course, we've got a Cloud Field Day event coming up next month. So that's what I'm working on now. Uh, if you'd like to get involved in Cloud Field Day as a delegate, uh, please do reach out at S. Foskett on Twitter or S. Foskett at gestaltit.com. We're always bringing in new people for AI, Field Day, Cloud Field Day, Networking Field Day, any of them. Uh, so please do reach out to me. Um, and uh, also check out the list at techfieldday.com of the companies that are presenting at Cloud Field Day because we've got some great, great, uh, really interesting uh, products coming in there, um, including some new companies that we've never seen before. So please do check that out. Uh, also, uh, I'd like to say thank you uh, to the world. Uh, we're starting to see the other side of this horrible pandemic that we've been covering here on the rundown for over a year. Um, I wish that uh, the vaccine were available to all people all around the world, and I hope that it is soon. But uh, I think that we're starting to see some hope here. And I think that, as you heard in some of these stories, uh, you know, that's becoming a, sort of a trend that we're starting to see some uh, rebound after the pandemic. And for me, that's a really exciting uh, opportunity. Yeah, I would wholeheartedly agree there. And, uh, you know, the, the next few months are going to be super busy as we try to figure out 
how we get back to normal. Um, the good news is, is that Stephen and I are going to be super busy for the next couple of months, bringing you great content, whether it's on gestaltit.com, where we do a lot of our media and, and written coverage, but also at techfieldday.com, where we have our great event series. You definitely want to keep that page bookmarked. Um, there's a great list of events that are coming up, but we're adding new events all the time. And uh, as we get the ability to add them to the calendar, we will definitely do so. Uh, you might see some interesting technology coming up before you know it. Um, and if you want to plan your schedule to watch your favorite topic, whether it's mobility or cloud or AI or networking or just good old fashioned tech field day, make sure you check that out because you don't want to miss it. And also make sure, of course, to update your calendar reminder for the Gestalt IT Rundown every Wednesday at 1230. Um, if you don't, have the opportunity to catch it when it's live. You can always check out our recording at our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash gestalt video. You can also subscribe to us in your favorite podcast application of choice. Um, if you do that though, please leave a review and uh, possibly some comments for the people that find the rundown uh, so that they don't think that this is the movie with Sean William Scott and The Rock, because obviously while I'm bald, I am not Dwayne Johnson. Uh, but, you know, that way people can find us and maybe have a little bit of fun with the news when it's not so doom and gloom. Um, so for Stephen Foskett, for myself, Tom Hollingsworth, for our great staff here at Gestalt IT, and for our wonderful, amazing community of influencers and practitioners, we want to thank you for tuning in. And we hope that you enjoy the day, the week, and we will see you again next Wednesday.